and why that's important and why Google has invested in that. So if there's any company in the world, there's maybe a handful of them who actually know what big data means. Google is definitely one of them. We have 30 trillion unique pages in our web index, trillions of searches that are done every year by users, billions of users, hundreds of millions of transactions. And with data like this, you can't use an Excel spreadsheet or uh, even tools like R. You have to use new tools that are created to handle all of this data. And so I want to talk a little bit about those tools first, just so everyone's on the same page as to what it means to deal with big data. The tool that we use the most is called machine learning. And there are really three types of machine learning. Uh, I'm gonna talk about all three, but the one that we wanna focus on is the one in the middle. It's the most important one for our purpose. The three, th three types are unsupervised, and what that means is it, it's sort of like what most people would think of uh, uh, people would do with big data if you had a bunch of data. You discover patterns within that data, find correlations, and use that to uh, produce insight about that data. And I would say, for the most part, the quality of that is on the lower end. It's what you use if you don't have anything else. On the other side is reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is analogous to a toddler learning to walk. Uh, they have a goal, they want to move from A to B, position A to posi position B, and they learn by doing. So they take a step and it moves them closer to posi position B. That's a good thing, that reinforces that they were doing the right thing. Or they fall backwards and fall down, and that reinforces that that's not the right move to make. And Google now has created computer algorithms or code that can do something like this for Atari video games, like Donkey Kong or Centipede. It learns about what the game is about and plays the game, uh, trying to maximize the number of points scored. And so, uh, as an example, um, after 300 turns of just looking at the pixels in the screen and moving the controller randomly or pressing a button randomly, our algorithm can now play Centipede better than any human ever could. Uh, and can beat the game every single time. So th that's the type of thing that you can do with reinforcement learning. Supervised learning is, is really the core of what we do with big data at Google. And you can think of it like learning from example. So the, probably the best example of this is a spam classifier for email. What we do is we take millions of email messages and then we have humans take a look at a subset of them, maybe 100,000 of them, and mark if the email message is spam or if it's a regular email message. And then we create an algorithm to learn from that data. We look at the ones that humans have marked as spam and find the features or factors in that data that actually lead to it being spam. So it may be because it's from a certain email address or done at a certain time, or maybe certain words are in that email. And then the algorithm learns which things are spam. And then once we feel like we've learned well enough, we apply that to all the email messages that we see. And we have the best spam filters in the world in Gmail. So let's take a look at sort of a generalized view of what machine learning is. And then we'll go into some examples. The first thing that you do is have to, you have to identify the interesting things in the data that you have. And what you do is you create a function and this function is no different than your function in seventh grade algebra, where something comes in and something comes out. You do something in the middle. Um, and so what we do is we take that function and identify the interesting features of the data that we have. We take a subset of the large data and uh, classify it or label it uh, in terms of uh, humans looking at that data. And then we run it back through the algorithm and see how close we got to what the humans labeled as spam or in a certain segment, uh, customer segmentation, et cetera. And once we're happy with that, we apply that same algorithm to all the data. So that's at a very high level. That's what machine learning does, and that's how you actually use big data today. So let's, let's look at some examples, and then we'll get into the market research application and why surveys are so important. So here's a couple of examples. This first one is from training on the billions of words in Wikipedia. Um, the idea here is that we take all of the words, 
In Wikipedia, it's already labeled in some way because of uh, the way that Wikipedia is set up. And then we find common examples uh, from it. So give it a tiger shark. What else is similar to tiger sharks? You can see in the first section, pretty much anything with the word shark in it comes up, right? Or car, uh, in the second column here, we see cars, but we also see things like automobile and pickup and dealership. These are all also related to cars. Not that we knew anything about those words, but that our algorithm can kind of find and cluster these together because they're labeled in certain ways. Or New York, in the last example here, um, New York City, of course, comes up, or New York State at the bottom, but also uh, Long Island and Brooklyn related uh, neighborhoods or uh, cities like Washington, which have similar importance in the world. Here's another example that we took from Google searches. So the interesting thing about a Google search is you kind of self-label the data as you're searching. Generally what people do is refine the search as they go along. So if you search for example, for example, Lady Gaga, you may be also searching for Lady Gaga tickets or uh, the Monster Ball Tour tickets for Lady Gaga, all in the same session. And so we have a bunch of label data about Lady Gaga. So now we can find the nearest matches in all of our information about Lady Gaga. And those are things like Christina Aguilera or Beyonce or Rihanna or her albums like Born This Way or the Monster Ball Tour. And the really fun thing that you can do here is use some simple math to do interesting things. So if you took some of the features of Lady Gaga that she's American, for example, and you removed that feature and you added this idea of a Japanese person. So you can do Lady Gaga minus the American part plus Japanese. And now you get uh, Ayumi, who is basically the Japanese equivalent to Lady Gaga in Japan. And we know lots of information about uh, the features that are important to these things. Last example here. Um, if you were in the session uh, a few talks ago, there were some folks talking about uh, labeling images uh, for coding or categorization. And we've developed an algorithm with the use of labeled data uh, that can take any image in the world and tell you what it's about. So uh, what we did here is uh, we gave it this first image of some folks playing ultimate frisbee. And the computer, knowing nothing about the image, just understanding what the features are in that data and having labeled examples of these things, looks at it and says, this is a group of young people playing Frisbee. That's pretty good. It's not quite ultimate Frisbee, but the computer basically got it right. The problem with big data, though, is that there are, it's always noisy. You know, there are always problems with it. Uh, there will never be an algorithm that will get it 100% right. So uh, in the middle here, we have this picture of a cat on a bed. <laughs> and the computer says, this is a close-up of a cat lying on a couch. That's really close, but not quite exactly what we were talking about. And then the, in this last image, uh, it's a no parking sign, I think, with a bunch of stickers on it. And the computer says, this is a refrigerator filled with lots of food and drink. I right? totally messed that up. But that's what happens when you have tough, tough images to recognize uh, and imprecise in, or incorrect algorithms. So how do we take what we've learned um, from building big data models at Google and apply it to market research? This has become extremely important recently with the advent of pro programmatic ad buying, where you can actually buy audiences uh, and target ads to them, a very specific audience, based on their cookies. And that's what we do. We take cookies of users that we track, basically people who have been on sites that serve Google ads, and we know which ads that they've seen, and we know their browsing behavior. We know things like, whoa, almost fell off. Uh, we know the sites that they visited, the time of day that they've been to those sites, uh, the browser that they're using. And we can take that data and match it with labeled data, meaning surveys. So we ask two million people, what's your age? What's your gender? How much money do you make? And we also have that cookie with, that, with the survey response that we get back. 
So now we have a bunch of labeled data about the users with the browsing behavior, and we have a bunch of unlabeled data from the billions of people that we see browsing the inter internet. And we can create an algorithm which will spit out for any given user what their age, their gender, their location, their income, their, uh, whether or not they have kids, what they're interested in, all kinds of information. And in fact, Google, probably 70% of the volume of surveys run on Google Consumer Surveys is for this exact purpose, to create new uh, categorizations and labels for users to use in ad targeting or other um, mechanisms. So it's a really powerful technique, and it's the, really the only way that you can verify the big data that you produce, the categories that you produce out of your big data algorithms. Here's another example. Um, let's say you wanted to do, one of our customers wants to do a customer segmentation, and they have a bunch of segments that they care about. One of them is early <coughs> empty nesters. These are people who are young, but their children have left to go to school. So we take all of the information that we know about the user, again, where they browse, the things they've purchased, what they've done on Google, tie it to a cookie, and then for some segment of them, maybe 10 or 20% of those users, we also send a survey, or we match a survey to them using our publisher network, which we have on Google Consumer Surveys, where people answer surveys to get access to content. That's kind of the, the way that it works. We ask them a question about how old is your youngest child, and then we use that data to feed into our algorithm and spit out all the people that we think are these early empty nesters. And now our clients can go target those users in ads. They can send additional surveys to them uh, to learn more about them and can do all kinds of different stuff um, uh, with the segmentation that we've created. So I want to just re recap here. Uh, short presentation, and, uh, but I hope it was informative. Algorithms that are used on big data have to be trained to increase the accuracy. We went from having a model which did, was about 60%, 65% accurate on age and gender uh, when we did it without training, using trained data from surveys, to something that's 90 to 95% accurate. We know we can't get 100%, but that's probably the best that you can do. The thing is, surveys are a great source of this training data, and surveys uh, and survey data collection has become commoditized in the last you know, five years. Uh, and so it's now at a point where you can actually do this in a cost-effective way. The more labeled data you have, the better your big data algorithms are going to be, the better your segmentations and the output is going to be. So you have to run hundreds of thousands or millions of surveys, 10 times the number of surveys that you would normally have um, for other purposes. And the thing is, the skills that you have now, the, the skills that you've built up, uh, understanding clients and insights, uh, being able to write these surveys and field them, these are the skills that are needed in the future. Uh, and they'll have huge impact on the, the sort of outcome of the, the big data processing. And for, for everyone who's sort of new to the market research space or innovators in this space, trying to build new tools, this is an area I think in the next 10 years will become very big as programmatic ad buying, programmatic access to users uh, only increases over the next few years. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. Okay, thank you, Paul. That was uh, really interesting. Any questions on the floor? I think you've got them scared. Or, or it was so clear. I've got one. I'm, I um, work with clients and sometimes they ask me, well, I could just do it with uh, Google surveys or SurveyMonkey, etc. If um, those sorts of service, self-service um, surveys are taking away part of the market research job, what are market research skills need to be developed further? Oh, well, first, I, I'd sort of refute the, the question or the premise of the question, which is that uh, these do-it-yourself platforms are t taking away clients or, or 
or uh, jobs from the market research industry. You know, I, I think part of our goal going into this project was how can we expand the pie? How can we grow the market research industry so that people who never had access to market research before uh, now do? And you know, part of Google's mantra or the ethos is that we try to remove people from the equation like, or from the answer because we think we can get more consistent and reliable results that way. But for a lot of clients, that doesn't work. You know, they, they're happy to work with a third party to actually collect the data and do uh, and gain insight from that data. And so we have to partner uh, with traditional market research firms. And that's what we are doing in the industry. We're not trying to compete, we're trying to partner with folks to really serve the need. Um, in terms of the skills that you need, though, in the future, I think they're very much the same as, as what you have now. Uh, those same skills, we, in fact, at Google, where I think we're kind of at the forefront of this is we have a large group of uh, market research professionals from the industry who are creating the surveys for our big data applications, um, who are doing the additional insight uh, generation on top of the survey data. And they're using the same skills that everyone has today. This isn't a doom and gloom scenario, and I hope that that comes across. This is uh, a way forward, a way to see the, the interaction of traditional methodologies with the new data that we're passively collecting uh, and continues to grow day, day after day. Okay, thank you. Any, any other questions? We've got one over there. I don't know if anybody can bring a mic over. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. I, uh, first of all, amazing what you've done with Google Consumer Surveys. I think, uh, I think it's the coolest thing to happen in research in the last couple decades. Thank you. Um, I've actually got a great story I'll tell you really quickly. My wife's best friend, uh, a magazine came and photographed her house while she wasn't there. Her kids were in the house and they're suing the magazine for $10,000. And the lawyer said, the best you're going to get is 1000 I put a Google Consumer Survey up. Uh, two days ago, and in four hours, got a public opinion of Canadians showing that 90% found that grotesque. <laughs> and she's just said that in, and she's getting her 10,000 bucks tomorrow morning. All right, well, I'll take the $9,000 extra. I, yeah, I've, I've done way weirder stuff with Google surveys than that, too. So I, I was just curious about one thing you said. Um, about 70% of the surveys being done are, are based to inform pro programmatic buying. Yep. And let, let me just see if I understand this correctly. Does this mean that if Toyota is trying to find people to buy a new RAV4, they can ask a question and use what I'll call like audience capabilities to say, okay, now that these people have answered, yes, I'm interested in buying a RAV4, they can then through Google's ad platform target like audiences based on that survey. Yes, so um, it's, it's a project we call Custom Affinities on our ad buying platform. Uh, so let me back up though for a second. The, the number that I stated, 70% of the surveys, that's in terms of the number of surveys, not number of completes. It's maybe uh, the definition doesn't really matter, but I, I wanted to make that clear. And then um, most of what that 70% consists of is our own, uh, our own ad teams building demographic data or demographic inference uh, for all advertisers. So any, all, sorry, any advertiser can come in and say, I want you know, 18 to 24 year old males who are interested in photography or whatever. Um, so being very generic there. But we do have this program called Custom Affinity Groups where, uh, in fact, we just did uh, one of these, or I just looked at my email and, and saw a thread for it. But basically, we ask surveys of users. Uh, we use the same sorts of predictive modeling to apply that to a larger lookalike group um, using the, the, the inference that we have. Uh, and then uh, allow people to target those users in ads um, uh, in Google AdWords and double click for their own customers. So yes, that's exactly what we're doing. And that's really the feature. Uh, right now, it's, it's a smaller program, but that's where we're putting a lot of our effort. Great, we're going to have to stop the questions, but Paul, I think you're going to be around uh, in the drink this evening, so do catch up with him. I'm sure he can answer a lot more of your questions. So thanks again, Thank you. Paul.